Good everybody. It is your girl Freddie once again with another Mastering the Courage to Pivot. I have the honorable, the legend, father, Kevin E. Taylor. He has interviewed icons such as Luther Vandross, Natalie Cole, Dion Warwick, and also he is the creators of some of the most legendary programs we have on BET that we grew to love, such as Notarized. Also, testimony with Mariah Carey and access granted. We're going to talk more about that later. Let's give it up for Pastor Father Kevin E. Taylor. How are you? I'm well, beautiful. How are you, daughter? I'm doing good, thank you. Honestly, like when I was formulating the questions and just reminiscing of our conversation, I said, "Oh, I can't wait for this. I can't wait for this." Let's go. Let's go. So now, Kevin, we're at the end of 2020. How has 2020 been for you? You know, I mean, I love, you know, because you daughter, but I love the title, Mastering the, 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 the Pivot, because it's been the ultimate pivot I, at the beginning. So at the end of uh, 2020, a relationship ended. I mean, the end of 2019, uh, I left the job of five years in May and moved an apartment I had been in seven years in April. So it has 2020 has been a completely different landscape. Um, and so um, it's taught it's taught me, hmm, let me get this right. It has made me finish the test that I had incomplete so on in my life. Mm. Mm. Just some I don't that. To that. I, listen, I said I've said before that hell is not some ugly, fiery, ferocious place that you end up living in the rest of your life. Hell is something that is 98% of what you want, but the 2% that it is not is 98% of what you need. And Period. how many ways you settle for the good look or the good check or the good life when you're supposed to be living your best life. Mm -hmm. And when, when that 2% that, that, that you need in every way and you know what's available, that's walking in hell every day. That is your your favorite, that is your radio stuck on the, you know, on a station of music where every once in a while a song you like will come on, but for the most part you're trapped in. So, you know, the, the, the things that 2020 have taught me about me, the things I was avoiding. I think that's what it did too, because 2020, I think, put everybody on the ASSs. And really, like, contemplate a lot of things. You know, a lot of people did go through COVID, but this was, like, the year of reflection. I think a lot of people pushed that off for X, Y, and Z reasons. And 2020 made us realize, okay, we're never going to forget 2020 from the kids to the adults. We're not going to forget this moment at all. You know, I remember the first meme I remember seeing in uh, 2020 uh, directly related to COVID was... Uh, some of y'all parents going to find out what your kids' teachers been talking about. And the truth is, some of y'all going to find out what your friends been saying about you behind your back. Some of y'all going to discover what you've been avoiding, like the repercussions of what you've been avoiding. Oh, I, you know, oh, I can just brush that under the carpet and now the carpet pregnant. 2020 is gonna. That's going to be the slogan. 2020 is gonna, period. Yeah. <laughs> and so, as we know that coming into it, we might have paid better attention, but just like we do in America, we just hoped it was going to pass, you know, because because we are so ignorant to the rest of the world and we watched Ebola and SARS and H1N1 kind of show up in the news for a couple of days. We heard <gasps> about it, but it didn't stop here, so we kept moving. We hoped mm -hmm. it was going to be the same thing. Just keep it moving. Just You know, we even say, keep it moving. And it's like, no, I, I'm, I'm coming to your house. I, I, I'm, this is not some drive-by news story. I'm this is my destination, so. Right. So, hey, that is so true, but for you to, I think what I want my people to know today, because you are phenomenal, like some of us know about you, but I'm going to take it back, back to, even though this lovely man is in the great city of Newark, New Jersey, shout out to Newark, he is from Ooh. the humble, great city of Washington, D.C., aka during his chocolate city years. So, you put in your bio that you was living in the projects, but you lived across the street from some powerful lawmakers and business owners. How did that impact your life? So uh, if, if I could, there's a, the, the main street kind of D, M Street, D.C. Uh, is, is, is the, the same street that, uh, to the left of where I lived that are taking you to uh, the Navy Yard. 
to the right, it would have taken you to uh, Arena Stage and to the Wharf. So um, this main strip for me really did kind of expose the world because if I would just follow the road, I could get to these other places. I could get to this theater that people from around the District of Columbia came to to see award-winning plays. And while, you know, it took me a while to be able to afford a ticket, you know, I knew it was there. So it didn't distract me when I got that first job and wanted to go see, you know, this show at the Arena Sage or get downtown to the Warner Theater to see uh, an 18-year-old Jennifer Holiday in your arms who showed the box of God. You know, the world, that one, that road from, from the, that ran through my project, you know, um, across the street from this high rise where senators live just just gave me the cup, you know, even though, you know, it was high rise projects here and the waterside towers literally steps, step, you know, two blocks apart. It made the world possible. I was going to say it made it big. It just made it, it, it made it possible, though it was across the street. It felt like a lifetime away. It really wasn't. Um, the possibility of being able to cross the street, right? The possibility of the world being big enough for me to be able to travel in it um, didn't happen with that project, you know, with that high rise across the street. It didn't happen, you know, that time we were on the bus and I saw how close the theater was. It happened because of 11 year old me heard Natalie Cole say inseparable. And she talked about singing, uh, beginning to sing her junior year in college, right? For all of that DC offered, Natalie Cole pulled all of it close because she talked about college, which until she said it, I didn't know black people could do. And then she started to use words in common ways. Like people, you know, we say inseparable now, like, you know, because we know the song, but for that young black boy in the projects, for her to be singing with like a flower, you know, when we were growing up, you had to be able to spell a word, define it and use it in a sentence. I could spell it because I was smart, I could define it because I found a dictionary in the trash when I was nine and kept it like, my, you know, I learned a word a day and just tried to figure out how to use it in a sentence with somebody before the day was out. So there I had spell it, define it, you know, but I had no use it in a sentence because I didn't really understand it contextually. And so she came on the show, uh, 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 the Merv Griffin show, and she sang her hit record and, you know, we're like a flower to the to a tree, like words to a melody of love. There's no way we can break up no words that can make us blow our thing because we're just dun, 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 inseparable. And I was like, oh. And so it, it, she literally blew my mind. But then, you know, he asked her when she started singing and she said her junior year of college. And that, so, so, so imagine going from blowing my mind to changing my mind. She literally mm. changed the molecular structure of what my mind thought it could do. Now, I, I want people to pay attention to that carefully because those things played a huge role to the trajectory in your life. Picking Absolutely. up that dictionary, there's an old saying that goes, one man's trash is another person's treasure. Who throws out a dictionary? Who throws but, out a dictionary? Right, but... That, in essence, how you develop your vocabulary and your love for Natalie Cole and the exposure of D.C. kind of got you towards college because apparently you was a beast with the writing. And it, talk about, like, how a lot of people, um, a lot of colleges accepted your essay because you were just a beast with it. And, uh, and you know, and that had everything to do, like you said, with Natalie and, and thinking lyrically and melodically and, and being able to have a relationship with words that allow me to drop words in that didn't feel like, you know, because sometimes you could tell when somebody has gone through the thesaurus to find a word. And so um, it was it, it was a very interesting thing because, you know, it was my guidance counselor, who, you know, Dr. Georgia Brown, who, whose recommendation letter talked about how the young man that you meet might seem like some sort of anomaly because it might seem like he's putting words in the sentences to impress you. He is not. The word impressed him first. And I was like, <gasps> that, you know, she was like, oh, he uses them because he got them, he understands them, and he uses them well. And so, you know, that's the little kid who's, you know, called my brother recalcitrant because, you know, I understood that it was hard headed. And I, you know, I wasn't old enough to say hard headed, but I could say recalcitrant. And so it was, it, that was the thing. That was the, you know, that was the thing that got me, you know, at, at church being a little boy who always, you know, was called upon to host an event or to speak at the sixth grade assembly because it was, he speaks and he speaks well. But, you know, it took me, a, it, it took me a lifetime of being resistant, persistent, and insistent because. 
that boy got his behind for you know for for speaking a certain way. That certain boy got called, you know, that boy talked like he white when I answered the phone. Good afternoon, Taylor residents. But that's the only way I seen the phone answered on the television. You know, it was either good afternoon, blank resident, or hello, you know, and I, I wasn't JJ. I, I knew I wasn't grown enough to use answer the phone the funny ways on the sitcoms. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They were trying to be funny on Leave it to Beaver. They were just answering the phone. So I was like, I guess I can use this one because this one might get me popped in the mouth. And so, you know what I mean? But then that, mm -hmm. that also then became, you know, the be, being the responsible one because my mother knew I could hand, I would answer the phone when the bill collectors called. I would, I was the one who took the sixty-five dollar book of food stamp and went to the store because I wasn't afraid to engage adults. So I wasn't afraid to find out what was on sale um, because I was young doing it. People weren't, you know, weren't afraid to engage me. So you know, in Southwest, you'd be like, "Shorty, yeah, don't go get those. Go get them." Get those from the bottom because you know they didn't, and they got you know they got to give to you ten cents on the dollar. So get that whole rack on the bottom. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. I had every kind of person engaging me as that little boy because I was always in some old odd spot. I was in the library. I was doing grocery shopping by myself. You know, uh, you know, um, they, they. I was consistent in the way I answered the phone, and so it. it, it, it you, you know, you talk about old quotes. There's old quote about your reputation preceding you. So here you come, here you come, you know, here you come, Mr. Know-it-all. Here you come, Mr. You know, that same dude who would call me out about being Mr. Know-it-all would then ask me to help him study for an exam because he didn't want to lose his basketball scholarship, you know, or, or at the time, the high school was just a spot on the team. And one thing that you're mentioning is when you're having the mass of the courage to pivot, you have to master the courage of being yourself and be authentic to yourself. Because if you're not doing that, you're not going to be able to pivot because you're gonna, pivoting is going to be somebody else's dream. You stay right. true to you when nobody believed in you. When you when you was just when you was looking at Black Natalie Cole talking about college, watching this show, this show, and you were just like, I want to be that. And then you had so many critics when he's like, Wait, I wasn't doing this for you. I was just staying true to me. But then those same people that was talking about you needed your help in the future. How you talk to me, right? And then with that, you pivoted from Washington D.C. going to Guilford College. Yeah. And then again, like you said, you just saw college because of Natalie Cole, and I'm not too sure if there was a roadmap for you, so you stepped out of yeah. your comfort zone. And, it, and so, and here's what, when you talk about being authentic to yourself, let me show you where this shift is. Because right there, at, you know, when that, what do you do? I had, at 16, mama, I'm going to college, and she's like, baby, we need to talk. If mama ain't got money for college, I was like, I know, that's why y'all pay for me to go to college, because I'm smart. And I was just, you know, not, I'm going to get scholarship because I'm smart. That's all I knew it was connected to, which was interesting because there was a point, let me tell, I, I haven't told this story to anybody, I don't think. In eighth grade, I knew I was smart. And because nobody knew what to do with that young boy who was smart looking at college, nobody had conversation with me. And uh, in eighth grade, there was a, a, a a program called uh, uh, what was it? What was ABC? A Better Chance, A Better Choice, ABC program, and they were um, looking at young uh, young African American men um, and sending them to the Philip Endicott School, you know, the Philip Endicott School in like New Hampshire. And because nobody had a conversation with me about the benefits of being smart, going away to college, because remember I'm in D.C., so when I'm talking about going to college, I've got Howard as an option, George Washington University, American University, uh, 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 George Madison University is not very far. So I'm not thinking in, in, the, in, in that sixth grade boy about the perspective of needing to go far, it go up, right? Right. And so nobody had had any of those conversations with me. So when Philip Endicott School started talking to people about me, but never anybody sitting there down to talk to me, I felt, you know, there was, you know, I got, I saw the paperwork and they were talking about sending me to New Hampshire. And I was like, wait a minute, what did I do wrong? Because mm. the only time people in the community went away was to Lawton Federal Prison. And this was wow. further than that. So I was like, what did I do wrong that they want to send me so far away? So I stopped thinking. I stopped studying. I stopped doing the work. I stopped going to school. There was a three-month period where I didn't go to school. I just did. I got up in the morning with my brothers. You know, they, I might have cooked, and, you know, I might have helped my brothers with their homework. And then when they all went out, I went I went and sat down and, 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 on the, and watched the couch. 
uh, and sat down on the couch and watched television quiet enough so that the neighbors didn't know I was home. So they would tell my mother. But I was like, yeah, y'all not sending me away like a prisoner. And then, you know, the, after like three months, I'm serious, like eighth grade, you know, a notice came from the school that I hadn't been coming to class. And I don't, I think the truant officer showed up and my mother had the conversation with me. I was like, I don't know why y'all are punishing me for being smart. She's like, well, who's doing that? And I was like, cousin so-and-so went to jail and y'all sent him to Lawton prison. Mm -hmm. And I'm supposed to go 10 states away further than that. I must've really done something bad. Cause it, cause you know, and at, at the time being smart only had, you know, fight repercussions for me. So I was like, oh, so it's not just these knuckleheads, it's all of y'all. You mm. know, because you know, being from DC, you know, there might have been a number of teachers and faculty who had gone to Howard. Some of them came from other places to come to Howard and then stayed in DC. So even for them, the idea of, you know, college being local was a real thing, even though they had come from states away, I learned later. So it, it, I had to suffer through that in order to really understand what I was looking for in the journey of college when it became an opportunity. When I turned 16, and, you know, and, and, you know, had gotten that perfect SAT score, a PSAT score. Remember the preliminary PSAT? Yeah. So I, I did really well on that. And then started to get all of these, you know, uh, brochures and stuff in from colleges. And then one of those teachers, one of those counselors took me to one of the, you know, we went on a kind of a, uh, what was it? We went on the, the, you know, we went on a tour of all of the, you know, the Harvest, the Browns, the, the, the Ivy Cornell, League. all the Ivy League, you know, because it was like, yeah, the good, the black boy gets to go there because I knew I did. And this, this is the thing I don't mind saying to people: being from D.C. and being from a black atmosphere, we had a black man, black city count. I did. I was on a journey to see whether or not I was black, smart, or smart. Was I this anomaly thing or was I smart? So, you know, when they wanted to go to the Ivy League stuff, I was like, yeah, they want to fight. And I can't be the black boy trying to fight with this white boy over an A in a class because I don't know what he'll do to me. And quite frankly, if he do that thing to me, I don't know what I might do to him. So I didn't want that kind of, that competitiveness was not the, the I didn't operate well in that energy. And when Guilford College's uh, brochure came, its tagline was everything I've been looking for my entire life because its tagline was Guilford College, where your only competition is you. And I was like, Ooh. that's it. I was like, that's it. That's it. So walking onto that Quaker liberal arts school shifted everything for me because, you know, it was again me being independent. You know, they did a minority student orientation. So the first people I met were other uh, students of color and mostly African-American. And while the school was a small school, I was in a class, you know, that first day, that first gathering of like 40 students. So it didn't feel small. I feel like I was automatically building my own community. The first, you know, the first person I met was Dr. Celeste Carol Williams, who is still one of my best friends to this day. And that was 33 years ago. So it forged something amongst us that, you know, that, um, that was really solidified, especially since that minority student orientation included the black students who were who were not athletes, because the athletes had already been there, were already on this their own kind of bonding thing. So, um, but they also treated those of us who were there academically like, "Yo, what's good, fam?" So the two worlds came together that afternoon in the cafeteria, and it felt like, "Oh, okay, there's a little bit of everybody from the fam from the family here. Let's see what this is." And so, that's a, wow. I, I that is so monumental that you say that because I think a lot of times and a lot of youth experiences is like you can't be black and smart at the same time. And exposure meant everything. And I know at that time, even I was growing up, we were just getting exposure. Like you said, going away was not a good thing, depending where you were. And that kind of that hindered your courage in a bit. But eventually it took other people to open up your mind again and say, be right. you, be authentic. And then as Divine has it, Intervention has it, matched you with a school where you triple majored English, accounting, Spanish. Who does that, Kevin? Because I really, because you know, my accountant, I was, you know, I was, the, I was the numbers nerd. You know, I could do math in my head, and I was like, I'm going to do it. In, I'm going to do accounting. And then the English and Spanish just became, I love words. So it was like, when you got to fill out those electives or the other classes, the sec secondary classes, they were always English and Spanish, English and Spanish. And then, they, well, you went to college, you did your thing, and you got a job, you know, eventually, but we got to talk about from that job, how did you land into one of the most influential platforms in Black so, history? So that job, 
uh, that good government job was a, was a very pivotal place for me because I started that job my 11th, my 11th grade year, right? And so, well, yeah, the summer after my 11th grade year is when I first started there. And then uh, right, that done so well credit-wise that I got to do my last semester half a day. So, you know, I know most young kids would have gone home and like chilled the rest of the day, but I already had a job to go to. Um, and so that was from, geez, that was from 80, when did I start there? 82, the summer of 82 to 91. And I was there. And, the, you know, the good thing about having a, a, a job when you're a young kid in an office, especially, well, just in a good environment with good people. Every semester I went away, uh, at, after I finished a semester, they gave me a raise. I know that's right. You know, it was growing and growing and growing and growing. And after a year, you know, no, it was after every year. So when I came home for the summer, well, I would be there for a long stretch. I would have a new job title. But it was really promotional. Um, and then what it so because I ended up being there for like 17 to 26, by the time I, you know, uh, when I'm here, I am at 26, I got an outstanding, the award is just up, I got an outstanding uh, service achievement. Yeah. Uh, 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 evaluation for the end of the year and somebody had to you know look at you know you're young and you're a ds9 already that's just a huge accomplishment and there is no 10 this next level so you gotta wait to go up to an 11 so you'll be doing a ds you you know, a nine step one step two step three step so it's just kind of like you're gonna see success you'll see a raise but you won't see a promotion until I don't know, it's probably going to be a minute. Like, you know, you might have to be like 35 before you get there. But that's still ahead of the curve. And I was like, yeah, what I'm not going to do is just sit around and wait for a promotion when I've already topped out here, y'all told me. So the first two years, I mean, you know, so that was probably a, uh, about 89. But people started saying, you know, when they said that, that was me, I got the outset. And so I started shifting departments because I was in recreation centers and playgrounds. I was like, let's try cultural activities. Let's try, you know, communication and media. Let's see what other offices I could perhaps grow in. And the growth just never happened. Um, I ended up with a woman who ran the cultural activities department. And she's like, so my husband's looking for a legal assistant in his office. And my best girlfriend is looking for a managerial assistant, editorial assistant in her management firm. And I was like, I always wanted to be a lawyer. This could be my opportunity to break into this new field and to pivot. And how about this? This is the first time I heard God said, so if you trust me, take this job. And I was like, wait, I don't even know what that is. And I thought about this before. I used to watch Perry Mason. I, you know, my mama said, you're so argumentative. You would be a good lawyer. And you've opened a law opportunity. Why wouldn't I take this? You do what you want. But if you trust me, take this one. I take this one here. And I go to that job, uh, I inter uh, do an interview, and go. I'm at that job for two months, and for two months every day, I'm sick and miserable. Like, I'm in an office the size of my desk, probably, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe 10 feet across, you know. Maybe maybe 10 feet across, 20 feet long. But uh, you remember those, so those lights, those uh, fluorescent light, lights in the office had the flowing oh. air system around them. So I had no windows. Middle of July and August in uh, in DC, which is like breathing down the dog, the mouth of a dog. It's just hot. It's ninety degrees and it feels like one hundred twelve. And and so I would go into the office with a shirt and tie on, soaking wet, and the air blew on me until I was dry. You're right, every day. And so I I literally had an ongoing low grade fever for the whole two months. Um, and then they decided they were moving to Virginia from this downtown right across the street from the Warner Theater. Um, and they said, we know that, you you, you know, you're, on, you're new and you're on probation, so we're going to give you, the, let you know this job is permanent. You've got the, you've passed probation if, you're, if you want to move with us, if you're going to move with us, so that you know that you've got job security moving with us. And God said again, listen, if you trust me. I was like, oh, but that's fine now because I hated this job, right? And so I finally, for the first time since I was 12 and working, this is like, I'm just tired. So I almost said, baby, take a break. So I took two breaks. I mean, two weeks off. I was still getting paid because I had been with the, uh, the Department of Recreation for eight and a half years. They were still paying me my sick leave. Mm. Right? They didn't say, like, here's all your, all your, they paid me weekly on my sick leave and then sent me a check for my uh, vacation. Um, so in the meantime, I took two weeks off. So I'm tired. And then I go looking for somebody's like, you should get a job at a temp agency just to see what you want to do next. And I ended up, um, 
looking at the old yellow pages. I know y'all young people used to Google. I remember so yellow pages. It's a phone book of, of, of Google. It's like, and so I'm looking, I'm looking at the temp agencies, and I was like, Lord, I don't know how you choose a temp agency. I need help. I turned the page, and there was a full-page ad for a temp agency called Help Unlimited. I asked for help, and I got Help Unlimited. I was like, okay. Went there. Um, uh, they, they sent me to a firm for a week to do, like, administrative stuff. The next week, they sent me to ABC, and ABC, you know, I was doing office stuff, but it felt more media-based. And they said, you know, we've got a correspondent in London, and so we think you might be a good fit to send to go get him, because for your resume, you lived there. And I, you know, I was like, yeah, I, did, uh, I studied there. And I was like, wow, I always said I wanted to go back to London. This could be how I get to go back. Thank you. And as I was getting ready to hang up on the woman, like, thankful, like, oh, my God. She said, oh, yeah, and there's a position open at Black Entertainment Television. I'm sorry, for I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, oh, what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? I, I, I want BET. I, I, I'll take BET. Because two years, two years before that, what, where the real shift happened is I ended up, while I was still working at the Department of Recreation, getting jury duty. And that jury duty assignment sent me to downtown D.C., and I ended up getting on a bus to go back to my office. That bus went past BET, which at the time I didn't know was in D.C. D.C. Mm -hmm. went past, and I was like, oh, my God, I would love to work there. And that was the only prayer I prayed, because the only one I knew, oh, my God, I would love to work there. Didn't send a resume, didn't know what to do with the prayer request, because how are you getting television? You must do television stuff. And I haven't done television stuff. I've done numbers stuff. And so that, that Monday morning, I uh, reported to BET and gave my resume to the woman who um, uh, was the office manager, Deborah Parker Williams. Um, and she uh, got me an interview with Lydia Cole the very next day. And I sat down with Miss Cole. Uh, to talk about who, this girl who ran, it was the executive director of the uh, music programming department. And um, it was a 46 minute interview. And she asked me afterwards uh, if, I, um, if I had any questions. And I said, yes, ma'am, just one. And she says, what is it? And I looked down at her name tag and her name is Lydia N. Cole. And I said, ma'am, what does your middle name stand, stand for, middle initial stand for? She said, I'm sorry? She said, why are you asking me that? I said, because if your middle initial stands for Natalie, I'd be working for Lydia Natalie Cole. And God told me that would mean I'm supposed to work here. So um, that's, you know, that, and then she said, are you serious? That, that's the only question you have? I said, yes, ma'am, that's, that's the only question I got. And she said, welcome to BET, I'm Lydia Natalie Cole. And the funny thing is, as many women know, and I don't know, I don't know if younger women know this, back in the day, most women, Move their middle, the last, their last name to their new middle initial. Yes. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and so she should have been Lydia J. Cole because she was Lydia Jones Cole, which is a, uh, you must be a Jones. It's her new, she's got a new book out. So now she was in touch with me about books because I've had some. But um, that was my kind of, you know, breadcrumb from God on the way that this is where I was supposed to be. And it didn't jump off quickly because, um, and this is a story I rarely tell. Because then after she um, had that interview with me, I stayed for a couple of more weeks in the, in the front office. And then the assignment ended. And I was like, well, I'm supposed to be here. And then I ended up leaving and going somewhere else. And then a law firm. And then BET's legal department called me back. And I went to see her like, hey, I thought we connected. But what I said to her was, hi, you didn't actually, when we, when we met, you didn't ask me for any references. And so I had a piece of paper with all of my former bosses on it. And so she called me in her office that afternoon and said, um, so I'm going to be honest with you. And she said, I asked at the front office about you. And one of the, uh, one of the workers in the front office talked about how sometimes you weren't focused, that you could be playful in the office. I said, um, the, woman is, the woman who said that, I said, the woman's name, I said, she says that because she uh, doesn't know what to do with the fact that I'm finished with most of my work day by 1230 because I type 104 words a minute. I said, but mostly she's upset that she wasn't at her desk when her boss called and he was stuck on an airplane trying to get to a meeting to New York. And um, I uh, had the driver go back to get him and got him on the Acela uh, uh, um, Amtrak. And he still made his meeting. And I think she mm. thought I was after her job. And I said, I was just, that's what I do. My brain was like, he, his plane's not going to leave. We called the office. The meeting was still happening in New York. So I had to get him to New York. I was like, that was it, you know? And so she went, and so she called my bosses. And when she came to me the next day, 
He said, I, I should have I should have done different and she said I should have done my due diligence. And welcome to the E. T. And so Hold that thought because my cat is putting on my nerves. One second. Uh oh, come on, kitty cat. One second. What up, Sparkle Shine? What up, Chatster? Oh, what, what up, Fortress Prime? What up, Havoc? What up, uh, Melissa Elizabeth? Hey, hey, Lance, so I'm back. hey Roger, and I'm Roger to... Maloney, I see you, King. Out of everybody that's coming in, thank you. So, but it's interesting because, again, a lot of people are scared to speak their truth, but you spoke your truth because some people would have been like, no. But you, you stood to your guns. You stay true to you. You followed your dream. Your love for Natalie Cole. Your love for words got you to BET. So now, how did you become a host? So, so, uh, so that was March of 91. And I remember being in a staffing meeting, uh, a, music, uh, a music department meeting, and asking in March, they're like, what are we doing for Black Music Month? What, you know, what are we doing for Black Music Month? And they were like, we don't know. I was like, what do you mean you don't know? Black Music Month is a very big deal because I read trade magazines all the time just because I've always been a reader. And I was like, you mean we're not doing anything to celebrate ourselves? I know our existence does that, but and they were like, well, you got any ideas? And I was like, yeah, let's do Diva Week. You know, the gay dude talking about, let's do Diva Week. But what I was thinking was, I remember the big deal it was when Ed Bradley interviewed Lena Horn once on 60 Minutes. And I was like, oh, she did the whole segment. It was like 10 minutes long. I was like, we never see those, you know, except with Donnie Simpson. I was like, so let's do that. But let's do it like, it's a, you know, video, video Soul used to be a two-hour show. So I was like, let's do a whole tribute to our divas while they're alive. And so we got, uh, we couldn't get Natalie because she was on the Unforgettable Tour. Aretha wouldn't fly. But we got Diana Ross, Patti LaBelle, Gladys Knight, Shaka Khan, uh, Nancy Wilson. And I remember having to convince Miss Cole uh, that Phyllis Hyman should be on the Diva list because, you know, they were kind of going by hits. Um, and because we were in D.C., Phyllis, you know, was renowned in D.C. So she was playing out at the Wolf Trap Amphitheater. And so she, she and her husband and I went to see Miss Hyman. And it, it's almost like Phyllis knew that BET was in the audience and we were using this as almost like an audition, right? Because she came out to uh, What You Want to Do for Love in this low-cut, high-hat, low-cut dress, I had in a cloud of smoke, but the the tour de force moment was, um, she sang uh, "Living All Alone," and it was you know it's it's one of her like destroy the room songs, and in the middle of it she does this whistle like a whistle solo, you know where instruments should be playing, she's whistling like it was ridiculous, and I screamed out "Call the birds home, diva," and the whole place went berserk. Um, and then she leaned over, she said, Booker, like that's, yeah, that's, that's diva. And so um, it was always that, that weird sense of connectedness to music that opened up the opportunity, right? So there were people, you know, I ended up uh, the next year, Miss Cole made, uh, uh, the next year, so 92, Miss Cole made me the music research and record label liaison. So I was like, oh my God. You know, at first she didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to fulfill the position. I was like, but I do it as your assistant anyway. Everything on this list, I do. Um, and she's like, ooh, you know what? Da, 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 da. And so she could pull that part out of that job and then make, you know, just hire an executive assistant. Um, but then the next year, Ms. Cole got pregnant. And the woman, you know, the woman who ran the entertainment department took over music. And then that's when I realized, that's when I started to hear what people thought about me. Because they were like, you can't keep him because he was too loyal to her. And I was like, I'm loyal to loyalty. Call any of my bosses. That's who I am. Um, and there was that woman, Cindy Mahmood, who was like, so uh, we've gotten a request. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I'm in the room uh, for, for an interview. Okay, okay, with Natalie Cole. Uh -huh. Because Natalie hadn't been able to really do interviews with anybody unless they joined her on the road. Because Unforgettable, when it jumped, it jumped fast. It literally jumped from like 2511 Four two one, like, and she and she started touring the Father's Day that it came out, and was on the road for two years. So now with her new album coming, she's like, I really, you know, God bless her, and much to her credit, she's like, I owe the Black Media, I, I, I owe Black um, Black Media, especially BET, because other people were able to just join her on the road. BET couldn't, because you know, so much of our stuff was studio was in studio and live. So she was availing herself 
to for an interview. And so she's like, go home, write questions for and I was like, oh my God, this is the greatest moment ever. Full circle moment, y'all. Full yeah, circle yeah. moment. I'm going I'm going to interview Natalie. I'm going to know I'm going to write questions for somebody who's going to interview Natalie Cole. So my boss calls me in the next day. She read Natalie Cole was the first black artist to, uh, the first black Artist to be best new artist at the Grammy. Yep. Natalie Cole had a degree in German. I mean, in psychology, she was going to be a doctor. She's like, I've decided who's doing the interview. I was like, it's going to be Natalie Cole and Donnie Simpson. And she said, so you. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And I said, for what show? She said, I don't know. Create it. And I was like, wait, this isn't how this happens. And she says, it's how it's going to happen for you. She said, because this technical stuff, how to edit, how to, you know, da, da. you can, she said, we can teach you that. This something you've got. I don't know what, how to even explain it. She said, that's rare. And it's so funny because I promise you, this sits here all the time because it's my office. This is that moment. That's mm -hmm. me in 1993. And that's not the it? Again, is, it, full circle moment. As a kid, the same woman that inspired them woman. to go to college, that to dream the, uh, the undreamable. He gets to interview. This is what happens when you master the courage to pivot. If he would have listened to all those people, he would never have that opportunity. Keep that in mind. And that were, and so and what's really powerful, uh, much to your point, is if I had listened to those people because Natalie Cole hit a bump in the late eighties where drugs tried to devour her career. And that's what people got to go see your the lady you like, she's a drug addict, she's a cocaine, she not blah 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 blah. Don't care, I love her, don't care, don't care. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't what she was doing for me, it's what she had already done. It was what she had already poured into me. So, you know, I was one of those people who dug my nails in. I was like, I love her, I'm never going anywhere. I had, uh, you know, used to be to go to the mall and get like iron on shirts and stuff. I had gone and got me like a backpack and said, Natalie Cole's number one fan. Cause I was like, if you was going to fight me, if I was going to fight you about anything, it was about Natalie Cole. So mm -hmm. I did not mind whatever it took. Right. And so that was, you know, that's the, that's that 82, 83, 84 where things were rough. And then she went to rehab and, you know, made a comeback and, you know, and I was in my, I was on campus. Nope, I was in the the, the mailroom area where you go to pick up your mail. And my best friend was with me, and I pulled out an envelope uh, uh, out of my, you know, got a letter in uh, in my in my mailbox, and I was like, oh, I got a big letter. What is this? You know, it's almost it was almost the size of like an acceptance letter from a college, and it was like, what is this? I'm at college. I don't need no acceptance. <laughs> and I looked at it. And I was like, oh my god, I recognize his handwriting. And I, you know, my best friend, you all right? And I was like, yeah. And I opened the envelope. And when, as I pulled it out, the first thing that appeared was the word Natalie. And I knew it was a letter or Natalie Cole's letter. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And look, it's right there. In my, let me see. It's, I want to, I want to. We're taking a tour, honey, y'all. Just let y'all know. Look, because this is the Natalie Cole corner of my life. See, there's the. Wow. That's the company she used to be the spokesperson for. That's the poster from Unforgettable. That is various and sundry pieces of memorabilia, including like letters and notes and uh, backstage passes. And that right there, that purple letter right there. Her favorite color too. Yep, is, is it. That right there is the letter from Natalie dated April 25th, 1986. Wow. And I was like, oh, my God, what is happening here? Natalie Cole has written me at college, you know? And, um, you know, just kind of like, thanks for being such a big fan. And, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, that, if that was the greatest thing, if that was the closest connection we ever had, wow. But this picture represents the way it kept growing because that letter then became uh, a year later, I got to be Nancy Wilson's um, personal assistant for a weekend because she was doing an, uh, a gala for Mr. Johnson and Ed, uh, Ed Roebuck, her, her lifelong personal assistant, could not make it to DC that one particular weekend. And they were like, you do it, you do diva. So I didn't go to church. I was with Nancy Wilson from Friday through Sunday till I put her on the airplane. And um, we just got to have conversations we couldn't imagine, but that Friday, Mr. Johnson had an event for her at his home 
and Natalie and her husband at the time were in town for a whole other event. And so I'm standing talking to Ms. Wilson this way and somebody covers my eyes and then I turn around and she's like, oh my God, I didn't know you would be here. And I was like, Natalie Cole recognized me from behind. Then while she was still holding on to me, she reached over to kiss Nancy Wilson. I was like, so now I'm the meat on a Natalie Cole, Nancy Wilson sandwich. Life couldn't get any better. Then at that same function, she said to me, so Kevin, you know, make sure I have all your numbers because I'm, I just signed a book deal and I'm going to need you. Love all words, y'all. Go need him. Just let you know. And if you picked up, if you pick up a Angel on My Shoulder, Natalie Cole's autobiography that became the award winning uh, Living for Love, the Natalie Cole story, I wrote the last 12 pages. I got the last word in Natalie Cole's autobiography. Hmm. I don't even know what to say to that. I don't Same have anything to say. Full circle moment. Dead to dream. That's what I'm talking about. And also, you stay true to you. At a time where being proud of your sexuality, that was not the norm. Couldn't do that. And you was at a all black, all black company at that time. So you was not scared to show your flair. At the end, so here's what happened. Here's what being from D.C. helped. Be, that's a definite being from D.C. That's being from the hood, because I've already fought those fights. I already know what it's like for a dude. You say, y'all whoop your effect, and then have to beat the smack out of him or have a good fight with him. And then, you know, two days later, he's trying to hit me up in the corner. It's like, yeah, well, you just tried to fight me. Oh, this is really like the knucklehead boy who doesn't know how to tell you he likes you. So he punches you. So it was all of that, all of that stuff. So, but by the time I did, you know, by the time I was at BET, at BET, I had been doing activism work. I had been, you know, on television and 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 the chair of the LG, you know, the Black uh, DC Coalition of Black Lesbians, Gay Men, and Bisexuals. I'd already found the authority in my voice. So the idea. So for me, the the real pivotal part of the conversation wasn't the just wasn't the daring to have your voice, you know, in black spaces. It was daring to be strong for people who were just discovering there. Because mm -hmm. being in the industry was, you know, I knew about people who weren't, you know, who were closeted, that, but who didn't know how to stand in that, but they'd come by my desk and there'd be a picture of Maxwell or The Rock or, you know, Keith Hamilton Cobb or Lenny Kravitz. And they were like, oh, so people, you just got pictures up at your desk? And I was like, if he can have them video victims, if he can have Janet Jackson, I can have The Rock. Agreed. I can have Lenny Kravitz with no shirt on. I can do what I want too. So it was just that, you know, we've been being in spaces where people would, you know, on Friday afternoons where, where we'd be in there laughing and being black together. And somebody would be like, my girl, and somebody would be like, my man. And I'd be like, well, my man. And they're like, did you just not change the pronoun? And I was like, oh, I thought we were just telling the truth. I thought we were just black hanging out like boomerang, you know? So I didn't know that there was this expectation. And I, it, that's when I started to notice that some of the, gay men who I was friends with used they, right? And didn't and and and, and so I was like, oh wow. Well they I would say partner activism. instead of saying what? Right. And so I was like, I got some activism work to do inside this company. Okay. But now I want you to understand something that by him being unapologetically himself and taking a stand for what he believed in, you was a blessing to somebody else, RuPaul. Talk about that. And it's so funny too because you know when RuPaul came out, uh, you know, mid '90s, you know, mid early '90s, people, you know, I think people expected from a very, you know, assumed homophobia space that black black entertainment television wasn't going to be receptive. But Supermodel of the World was everything, and we had the spaces for it. We had Video Soul, Video Vibrations, Midnight Love. We had several kinds of formats, and Video Vibrations could be very dance oriented because it was mid afternoon, high energy. It's the same place that Black Box was, uh, CNC Music Factory where we played first. Some of you know people forget that early '90s hip hop like the Jungle Brothers and even Queen Latifah's Queen Latifah's Give Me Body. You know, it was right. a lot of kind of housey stuff, and so RuPaul fit right into the pocket of it. And it was just, you know, it was it was cosmopolitan. It was, you know, it was over the top. And it was a great song, you know. And then the album came out and, you know, the, it was great material on it. So video LP with Sherry Carter's show, you know, had that kind of energy on it. Again, it was early, mid me. And then it was, you know, when Rue came in, Rue came in, you know, just kind of six foot five dude with plaid shirt on, you know, light brownish, freckles, you know, bald headed. You know, tall ish, but six five is tall, barefooted, right? 
went to the dressing room and seven foot tall RuPaul came out. We were like, I mean, literally, you saw black dudes like, because RuPaul's <laughs> they're tiny, you know, so RuPaul did that, you know, with the right padding and, you know, this green dress and this blonde fro that was literally this big. And we were just kind of like, she's charismatic, she's, you know, she's stunning, and, you know, the energy is right. And it just, at RuPaul, it was a stone cold performance. So we just made the room for Ru because, and then it became a fight because at first, let me put it real quick, because at first it was just kind of like, okay, here's Ru the dance artist, Ru works here, Ru works here. Um, and it was no real kind of fight about it. The fight for RuPaul happened, or the fight about RuPaul happened when some fundamentalists decided RuPaul couldn't be on our Christmas show. Mm. Right, because she had done a, you know, she had done a kind of dance uh, remix of uh, the drama, little drama boy, which they got nothing to do with churchy stuff anyway. But they just like this is the season of Jesus, and she don't get to be on this show. I said, first of all, you don't tell us how to run our network. Second of all, you ain't even heard the song. Thirdly, we, thirdly, where's your Christianity? Because fourthly, RuPaul gonna be on the show. Click. <laughs> so, Period. Yeah, and so you know, for the longest, RuPaul was always. You know, consistently present at BET because we were consistent with Rue. We would do, we did that. Black, we had a. Let me tell you this: when Black Box, this group that was signed to RCA, came out, we played the video because the song was called "Everybody, Everybody." And we were like, but in the video review meetings, we were like, y'all know we know who that voice is, right? And then CNC Music Factor came out. You know, with uh, I can't even remember the name of the song. Uh, I, mean, I gotta look it up real quick because the <laughs> funny thing uh, uh, it was it was it, it wasn't things that make you go home. I think it was whatever the song was before that. But you know, we were like, all right, it's one thing for us to be taking this off little weird song that's got dancers. Gonna dance. make you sweat. Everybody dance yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. And we heard that for everybody, and I was like, uh, uh, y'all, listen, listen. I get it. I get that this is a visual engine, but that's Martha Wash. She was one of the two tons of fun she sang behind Sylvester. That voice is too. I don't know who this is, and we don't know what this is, but somebody gonna have to figure it out because we literally at first were like, we having a problem playing this video. We're not playing this video because we know that that voice of that girl singing is not that voice. We know who that is, and what we're not gonna do, you know, you know, even though the girl in the group and both groups were black women. It was skinny, you know, model like black women. And we yeah. like, we know who this is. And so BET got named in Martha's lawsuit against RCA Records because we had, you know, we were like, we're not playing this video. Y'all got to figure what this is because this ain't right. And so, you know, they settled it in a lawsuit. She had to be named in both music videos that literally said, visualized by blank, vocalized by blank. Wow. And then when Martha Wash came out with her recording for RCA Records, we were like, so what we're not going to do is fight for her and then not support her. So it was like, right. right. So when she came on to do video LP, we sat her down like in a throne chair. And she had, you know, they had dancers around her. And it was like, yeah, she gets to get her due because it's just another way that black, the, the music industry had picked black artists. And we weren't gonna be a, we weren't gonna be privy to that. So you know, we've seen the we dealt with the weight issues in the industry, we dealt with the color issues in the industry, we dealt with the sexuality issues in the industry, and did everything that we could to make sure that we stood up strong for artists because you know there would be people who would come to BET and stay all day. You know, first and foremost, they did it because you know DC BET was in DC, so they would have to come from LA or New York to do BET. So they were like. Okay, so can we record something or we can just end up doing two shows in the same day? Because I ain't wasting this time with BET. I'm not wasting it, you know. And so they would be, you know, they, it was family. So they'd be walking around downstairs. Sometimes they would, can we see upstairs? You know, you'd be sitting at your desk. I remember the day Janet Jackson said no cameras. Like, she meant like no media film cameras, but we could all bring our personal cameras. And she literally walked around and met every employee of BET to say thank you. And I mean, from the cleaning lady to Mr. Johnson. Wow. That's what's up. That's and you said Whitney Houston did the Houston. same thing, like when nobody was not allowed to take pictures with her. And she was like, yeah. Excuse me? She was like, What's wrong? Why is it nobody why is nobody speaking to me? And I was like, Miss Houston, we were giving the old Hollywood avert the eyes, nobody talking to me. Oh, she was like, Oh, F no. Oh, oh. you know, she was nook all day. She was like, Oh, hell no. And she was like, Hi, I'm Whitney Houston. And you are hi. And we I walked her around that building because she was like, who told y'all that? She's like, that's why I have problems with black people, because y'all telling people if like that. And I'm like, listen, we were told to stay out your way, stay out your face. You know, you would be in here by yourself, go to the set, leave. She's like, yeah, no, that's not happening. 
Because, and you now, know, mm -hmm. go ahead. Now, I was going to say, with all that, he's been doing big things. Like, he stood his ground. He helped. He blessed other people like RuPaul. You created top programs, testimony, notarized, lyrically speaking, access granted. Now, why access granted is so important, and I'm so glad that he created that, because for my millennials and older, BET Access Granted was the last program that shoot behind the scenes for Aaliyah's Rock the Boat. You got to see Aaliyah grow up. How was that experience like? And, and that's really important, too, um, as it relates to the whole scope of BET, because I remember looking back after, uh, after Aaliyah died and remembering that I met her and R. Kelly at the front desk to walk them onto the set of Video Soul when she first came out. So that happened in 94 with her first project, uh, right here, uh, and Age Ain't Nothing But a Number. And it happened on, like, the I Love You Girl, Take Care, and Seeing the Last Thing She Did. Uh, I, Aaliyah was a phenomenon, you know? People, people don't realize that. I was like, you're not just dealing with this young girl who was becoming, in, you know, coming solidly into her own artistry with more than a woman. And the style, you know, the style, we watched that, that last project was 18. She was walking into womanhood. So she wasn't hiding as much behind the hair. The clothes, they took on a different shape and a different presence so that she showed herself off more. Uh, so the, the, the musicality that, that, uh, that, uh, Timberland was working with, you know, put her in the music more beside each other. So there was, you know, there was a different pocket of it, a different sound. And, you know, there was Romeo Must Die and Queen of the Dam. And she had all, you know, people forget when they look back on it that the Nona Gay role in uh, The Matrix would have been Aaliyah. But, you know, she didn't get to shoot. So, there, you know, there was, there was a whole world opening up for her. And um, she would have just, you know, she would have been up. I don't even know because she was already a phenomenon. She would have been, she would have been Diana Ross, like Whitney Houston, like in her presence in the in the in the in the music and entertainment industry, just because you know she was one of those you know one of those kinds of lights. And you know, God bless her. Beyonce has worked hard to be in that spot, but you know, I think Beyonce would have been a different kind of actor uh, uh, artist if had had. had had Aaliyah still, still been around. I think Destiny's Child would have got three or four more albums out of themselves, you know. And you were supposed to be on that plane. Like, literally. Because um, when, so a lot of people may or may not remember young, young, young enough. So you know, I remember Aaliyah was on 106 in Park on Tuesday. Um, and that's when we had all the, you know, quick conversation in the green room, like, hey, I'm your dude that's going to meet you in Miami so that we can do Rock the Bell. She's like, oh, good, da, 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 da. And she, you know, at the time, uh, she was dating Damon Dash, and she was like, so look, we need a little something so that if I need the cameras to go off. And it's not like they were going like, to make out in the middle of the video set, but, you know, that, that the early 2000s where, was, where, was where trash media was really just starting to happen. So if my camera had turned and got her hugging, we could have sold that footage to somebody. But I was like, I'm trusting you to let me on your set, otherwise I wouldn't even be here. This ain't an open set. This is your set. And so I was like, look, look. See this right here. You do that. Because people hear me talk about it. You do that. And my my, my the iris on my on my lens closes. Because I ain't trying to get nothing. And so by the time he showed up, I had, you know, I saw he had to brush past me to get to her. So when he brushed past, hey, what's good? Because he remembered me for one of my music specials or something. So he's like, hey, what's up? And then he kind of tapped me on the shoulder and didn't say anything, just kept moving. And I tapped my camera guy, like, all right, yeah, all right, we got what we need, you know. But, and um so we were in Miami for two days, and then we got on a plane to go to uh, Abaco. And Gina, Gina Smith, God rest her soul, spoke to me in Miami. She was like, Kevin, I know I told you you have full access to the way we had programmed it, which gonna, you know, was going to be you on the plane with us. But you know, she really would like her privacy because people forget that the Rock the Boat uh, video wasn't supposed to happen. You know, uh, We Need a Revolution was the first song from, uh, from More Than a Woman. And then, uh, then More Than a Woman was already yeah. done. And radio grabbed Rock the Boat, and it blew up. And so they put together a quick video with Hype Williams to support the song. And so, you know, it was a already, you know, already solid promo tour for her that ended up with this kind of, you know, four-day shoot that wasn't supposed to happen, you know, and I think that people don't realize what that's like for an artist, where you think, okay, you're going to be traveling, traveling, you get radio, you know, 
you know, interviews, photo shoots for to go along with those layouts and vibe and time and that kind of stuff. And in the middle of it, you got to take the four day stretch you were supposed to have off and make a video. You know, imagine that you've been working for, you know, three and a half months straight every day. And even the four days you had, you thought, you know, the four days you're going to just get to sleep late. Because people forget video shoots start at 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. And that's when they saw a shoot. So she's got to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to get ready for the shoot. And so it was a whole lot of that. And then at the last minute, I was told, you know, so anyway, I had to preach in Baltimore later that, that Sunday. I mean, that Saturday anyway. That Sunday, yes. So on Saturday afternoon, I was like, let me just, you know, leave this shoot here because they were leaving Saturday evening. And I was like, let me just get on an earlier flight and get to Baltimore. And by the time, so I, we went from Abaco to Miami and Miami to, uh, to Baltimore. Got to Baltimore, two of my deacons had come down from uh, from church in New Jersey, met me at the hotel, unpacked my bag, and then uh, we went and got something to eat. And then I got back to the hotel and my phone started ringing. My phone started ringing because... Everything happened. Yeah, everything happened. And, and, and that's the part of it that, you know, when people, when you look at certain sides of the industry. So it wasn't just that, oh my God, that girl and the people you were just with died. It was also, and um, you got the last footage of her alive besides the music video. So when the music video was shooting images. She never got to see the finale. I shot B roll. So I got her talking to the cameras. So the last footage of her, they've got images of her. I've got footage. So I was like, so hurry up and get to New York because we need that footage. And I'm like, and as we were, you know, I remember after the service, you know, I got up aware that everything had happened, went to service in Baltimore. After that service, they were like, all right, you got to get in the car and get here. And then Penny Mack, who you know, was uh, our senior creative director, was like, so here's a list of people that died. Because remember, the media was just kind of like, oh, Aaliyah died. Aaliyah died. Aaliyah died. And then and Penny's like, Aaliyah died. Chris Maldonado, Eric Foreman, Anthony Dodd, Scott Gallon, Keith Wallace, Gina Smith, Douglas Krantz. And it's like, wait, and so those people are all people to me. They're images, they're conversations, and moments of laughter. There's handwritten note that's still on my altar from Gina Smith. It was like the world did that, you know? Mm -hmm. And then there's Aaliyah, like this little girl I've seen, you know, since she was, you know, 13, 14, you know, and, and kind of had a look, you know, because when I when if you go back and watch the Rock the Vote video, she comes in and goes, Oh hey, time to shoot. You know what I mean? She's the first person she sees is me. She goes, Oh hey, that's the beginning of how uh, that access granite starts. She looks over and goes, Oh hey, time to shoot. Let's go. Like, come on, y'all. And so, you know, just she, she was sweet, she was smart, because I remember trying to get out of one of the shots. She's like, No, 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 I'm gonna come around this way. That way, you stuck in the shot, you know, and you could you could have that shot and just leave it in. You in the red leave shirt, <laughs> right? Because she because Aaliyah said, "Stay right there, don't move." And she, you know, that that, that was a little thing that um, that I didn't know anybody noticed. She's like, you know, I was watching the shows. I see you back there in the corner. It's it's very. She says, "Very strong singleton." I see what you're doing, making sure you're somewhere in every production. And I was like, "Yeah," but I thought it was quiet. She's ain't quiet. It ain't quiet. It's smart. So, hmm. but that unfor that unfortunate death prepared you to pivot again to go full time into ministry. Full -time Why did you decide to do ministry full time? Because the last six months, the six months at after Aaliyah's death, before I left BET in March of 2002, became creative arts ministry anyway. But there were prayer conversations with artists uh, as they were preparing, preparing to take breaks so we praying in the dressing room. There was seeing people on the streets who was like, yo, I, I mean, I've been, in, I've been in places where, you know, industry, you know, industry executives called me. And I was like, so Kevin, hey, and I'm thinking, oh, they want to hire my video production company to do something. Or they want to talk to me about a special. And I said, Kev, um, I'm just calling you for a word of prayer. And I was like, wait, it's not like any of these opportunities had like made the media show up at a church service and record me preaching. How do they know? And it was them saying, you called on the name of God and clearly God's got you covered because you got something to do. So yeah, yeah, pray for me. You know, and I remember, so I remember, I remember distinctively like the conversation of going into his dress room and 
dressing room to pray with Maxwell. And then coming out of there going, yep, he's getting ready to take a break. And that break went for eight years. But I could see the heartbreak, and I was like, yeah, you can't die for this. You got to have a life to sing about. You got to have, you know, you got to have something to write music about, write songs about. And that's not going to happen if you let them push you into the ground until you don't want to do this anymore. So. And then yeah. you're bridging two things that are opposites from each other. Sexuality, which is, you know, you're a proud gay man, and the church, and they've had, and that's been a tumultuous relationship. How are you bridging that gap? So, you know, so, so one time, so I had lunch. This is a name drop. I feel for me, this is the name dropping this moment of my life. But I was having uh, lunch with Natalie Cole in L.A. When I, I got off a of holy convocation, Natalie lives in L.A. Anytime she was home and I was there, I was going to make, we were going to have dinner or lunch together. You know, the only time I was so upset because when I got ordained elder, she was trying to get there, but she was working on the Natalie Cole story, the one she ended up making the movie for. She's like, I got to be in Chicago. Why is convocation this week that she was going to be like my guest at convocation? I was like, oh, but I didn't really care. I got to see her. Um, but um, so we were sitting at lunch one afternoon at a place called uh, Cape Mandalini. This well-known Beverly Hills spot that we went to, and you know we had lunch. And Patrick Swayze came up and said, and kissed her. Beyonce, Michelle, and uh, Kelly came up because they were there having lunch, and they kissed her. Um, and, you know, we finally got to breathe, and she was like, "I want to ask you something." And I was like, "Okay," and she's like, "And I, don't, and I was like, now let ask me so what could like what could you be asking me?' Like you know, and that's what I'm thinking. What could she be asking?" She's like, how are you okay being who you are? Like, as a gay man and a man of faith. Because her own younger brother had renounced his homosexuality before he died. I guess thinking he would get in that, you know. You know, people, church has beat people's souls up. So however that looked, it looked. And so she's like, how are you so okay? What's going on, Jazzy? Um, what's going on, Nick Few? Uh, and I want to talk about Nick Few before we get off here. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and I said, Natalie, all I got is this. God keeps on doing great things for me, and God knows it's me. I was like, so I, I get that people who have this secret relationship with people that hide in their sexuality. I was like, I've never been able to hide who I am. Between speaking the way I do, you know, whatever the carriage or courage that people see, you know, I've not been able to cock a hat or do something that made people like, yeah, I ain't know about you, you know? Because even, you know, even being smart was gay in the hood, right? You, so everything about me told people, yeah, you have to get it. So it became it, it, it became my costume. It, you know, it became my it became my cape. I was like, listen, so you're gonna come for me for being big, black, smart, and gay, then I'm gonna give you something to come for. And so when she asked me that, I was like, God keeps on doing great things for me, and God knows it's me. It was the it was the soundtrack, it was the theme song that I needed to help me do this. I was like, boy, you know I know you, right? But but here, let me tell you the truth, uh, daughter. Freddie, right, it goes all the way back. Uh, look, it goes all the way back to junior high school, hearing the preacher say, you, you know, after my pastor had died, this new preacher came in, preaching about abomination and, you know, who God didn't like. And I was like, who is this mama? What is he talking about? Mom was like, come next Sunday. He say something, you can leave. And he started one of those speeches, you know, one of those, because it wasn't a sermon for me. And I walked out down the middle of the aisle backwards. And I remember praying on the porch and I was like, God, like we've been cool since I met you. Like literally it was like that. We've been cool since I met you. When I get trouble, when I get in trouble on tests and don't know what to do, you clear my mind. When I'm struggling, the right song comes on the radio and it gives me a break. Like it was like, I thought we was good. I thought we was cool. Now this dude saying you hate me? Like look, I haven't even done anything. If who I am is wrong, take it. Just take it. I ain't done nothing yet. I can't miss what I ain't never had. And so, but I need, I, and I said, but God, I need to know you and me are okay. I need to know we, us, you know. So whatever that means, whatever that takes, I need you to give me a sign. And I'm praying that when I tell you, daughter, when I tell you that I prayed that prayer on a Sunday night and went to school on Monday morning and the cutest boy on, you know, the cutest boy in the ninth grade said, so listen, I don't know where I'm doing this, but something told me last night to tell you I like you. Like, cool, all right. And I was like, okay. So as far as I was concerned, I asked God for an answer and I got it. And and I've been I have been unstoppable since then. So it's just that. It's like, you know, people don't want to deal with people, you know, who struggle with sexuality and the success, look at the success. People who want to struggle with the other part going like, you know, God knows you. And as you know, it felt like the because a lot of people so Aaliyah happened on August 25th, 2001. The first time I got on a plane after that was September 11th. 
that same that's year. Like, yeah, and that that was 18 days later to get safely out. You know, we ended up our flight, uh, American Airlines flight, ended up getting taken down in Kansas City, and we drove to LA. And I happened to be on the plane with the crew that was from the Michael Jackson 30th anniversary special, the CBS. And one of the dudes on the flight used to work at BET. So he came to find, he saw me when we got on when we got on the plane. They were first class, I think. And he came to find me. He found me in the terminal, like, hey, we're getting ready to drive to LA. We got one spot left in one of the trucks. You want to come? I was like, yeah, yeah, because I knew I couldn't stay in this place by myself. Um, and so uh it just became this, this, this. It became this kind of conviction, like you are this, you know, no matter what people thought about my sexuality, no matter what people thought about my creativity, you know, there was people going, listen, there was people who weren't church people saying, listen, there's got to be something on your life because that's it, like two days that close, that close, that close, you know? And so, um, like even little kid, I remember my nephew was like, oh, Kevin, it's like your final destination. I was like, don't say that. Please don't say that. But it, it felt like, it felt like, okay, and then, then one day God was like, sir, what else do you want? Like, I gave you Natalie Cole first. I need you. But if there's something else you need, you can say it. And I was like, um, 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 um. Because literally, lyrically speaking, was born out of Natalie Cole. Natalie Cole begat Luther Vandross. Luther Vandross begat Anita Baker. Anita Baker begat Lena Horn. Lena Horn begat Patty LaBelle and, and Stevie Wonder in the same week. I introduced them in the same week. Then I fly to Europe to interview Tina Turner. Okay. Yeah, I say I interview big people. Mm -mm. I'm trying to be like him when I grow up. Oh, well, uh, okay. You changing the room again? Yeah. I want to see my neighbor, my beautiful singing neighbor. Um, so yeah, so it's like I, 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 when it was time to shift, God was like, "What else?" do you desire, right? Because it's like, I need you, the work needs you, like, you know, the ministry needs you, and, and what, you know? So, you know, it's like when people ask me, like, have you ever met so-and-so? It's like, no, I'm in the music TV industry. I don't have a reason to meet Ali or Denzel. Though 106 and Park became a lot of that. 106 and Park got so popular that Tom Cruise, Denzel, uh, Samuel L. Jackson were on there. But, you know, it just became kind of a, a boy from the project, so the fact black has met a, has met a gay nerd from the project ends up like in, in 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 a lifetime that before I got to forty, I had met all these icons, created shows, and got plaques on the wall, and you know, they, writing they, you know, and they, they everywhere. You know what I mean? They and it's like guys like, well, what else do you need? And I was like, oh, and I was like, well, what do you need? I think I need you. And so it became well, one that. day before you go, you got to talk about your books, man. Yeah. And so then, you know, what happened uh, is I ended up finishing on Clutter, Cleanse Your Spirit and Claim Your Stuff. I ended up finishing that on my last day at BET, March 30th. Uh, was it, I feel like it was March 30th, not 31st, but maybe it was the 31st. March 31st, 2002, I finished this book thinking, this will be the only book I write. It'll be a good guide book. It'll be a good uh, kind of accompanying book to ministry. It's uh, Unclutter, Cleanse Your Spirit, and Claim Your Stuff. It's in three sections. First, uh, delve into your pain and your past to see what stuff has stumbled you. Uh, design your, uh, discover who you're supposed to be with everybody, without everybody else's should on you. And then determine how you're going to design the life you're supposed to be living. I was like, ooh, that, that book still sells today as much as it did in 2002, and I thought it would be the only one I wrote. And then um, that was 2002. And then several years later, uh, this uh, author by the name of L.M. Ross wrote a book called The Long Blue Moan that my, uh, my, my brother Michael Gibson uh, introduced me to. Who always, we, we, Mike and I are uh, really good friends who, who is like a brother, a uh, younger brother. And we end up on the phone for like five or six hours. And it's like, all right, let's have a politics conversation. Here's this hour. This next hour is music. This next hour is television. This next hour is movies, you know what I mean? And in the book conversation, he brought up The Long Blue Bone. I read that book, and the ending made me lay on the floor and cry. And I was like, oh, my God, this is masterful. But what it also did is open up another portal of me. And these characters I had been ignoring for a while just came and started talking. And I dealt with this dude. I was dealing with this dude who's uh, 
after an ugly breakup, decides to bury himself in his work, you know. So for five years, it's work, 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 work. He's celebrating another success, but he's not celebrating at all. Everybody's like, come to the party, come out here. And he's like, nope, we're good. So we put good work. And um, ends up being left in the office by himself and then still it has this moment where he flashes back on the ugly, on the breakup. Um, and the song plays, but because he doesn't know how the system of the office works, he doesn't know where to go get the source of the music. And the song won't leave him alone. So he leaves the office at Friday and gets up Saturday. His best friend's out of town. So he ends up kind of having this Saturday regiment by himself. Um, and the song is somewhere in the back of his head. He can't explain it. He can't shape it. He can't talk about it. You know, he can't figure it out. So he goes looking at the old Tower Records. He goes looking at the old Colony uh, the record store downtown, uh, both in uh, I mean Midtown, and then finds this um, spot called Roadhouse Records, where we represent uh, the best and the rest. And so just an oldie spot. He's in there for several hours. When he walks in, he sees this tall, handsome dude. He's ignoring him because I ain't about that. I ain't about that. I ain't about that. Talks to an older gentleman at the counter, looking through stuff a couple of hours and can't find it. Just kind of like, I'll, I'll just get to work on Monday. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. And as he's about to sign out, uh, I mean, pay for his records and, and music and leave, the dude he was ignoring starts singing the song he's been looking for. And so he walks up to him and goes, uh, uh, and he wants to ask, who is that? But he asks, who are you? And it begins this love affair um, that is born out of the question, what do you do when you're through with love, but love's not through with you? And so that was my first novel, Jaded. And Jay, yep, yeah, yes. Yeah, yep, yeah, Esau yeah, got Esau it right. Shout out to Esau, who Esau, recently won a new one, award. A great content creator. And so Jaded began, uh, you know, and so I began, I've been on this journey of simultaneously doing kind of empowerment books and novels. And I'm praying that in 2021, 22, that Jaded, the motion picture gets done. My best friend, David, I was just talking about it last night. And I said that because I, and I said earlier, I want to talk about Nick Few. Because I think yeah. Nick Few is, I think he's my Joshua. I mean, I think he's my Elijah. I'm sorry. B. Slade is my Joshua. B. Slade, the brilliant uh, uh, artist and, and, and composer. He is my Joshua. Uh, Nick Few is my Elijah. Monifa is my Tanya. And a well-known online personality by the name of Carlton. He, is, he goes by Carlton Vibes. And it's so funny because I met his energy. And his energy was so my character uh, in the book, who's the best friend to Joshua who is just kind of like, you know, the dude that people, and this is a weird conversation, but it's a real one. His energy and his, uh, his, uh, his presence is so gruff and, and vital and funny that you almost don't recognize him as a gay dude. And one day, or one day on a pride thing, he's like, happy LGBT pride, everybody. And one of the dudes says, so dude, what are you? Are you the B? He's like, no, nigga, I'm the G. And it's like, wait, you gay? And it's like, why wouldn't you think that? Because he it was just because he's always kind of, you know, always like this. What's good, y'all, you know? And so now he's, he's watched him evolve in his energy so much. But um, what I didn't realize when I said to him, oh, my God, you might be you might be Joshua's best friend. And he was like, what I said to him is, you might be my Carlton. And he was like, your Carlton? That's nice. Nice to meet you. But what you mean, your Carlton? And I was like, that's the character's name. And he's like, wait, what? And then I looked down and realized his name is Carlton. I had not <laughs> seen it. I hadn't seen it. I hadn't connected it. I hadn't realized it at all. But he is so this character. And so that Nick is on here, you know, uh, Nick says, I absolutely am. I, you know, I saw Nick and I thought, you know, he's got the, because what, 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 Josh, uh, what Joshua is, is this kind of buried in my work energy. What, what, what Elijah is, is this tall, uh, we're we going to talk about him. He's this tall, broad, bright light that everybody sees, but doesn't get to know. So it's almost like he's the dude that everybody He's a gift that everybody wants to have on their shelf, but nobody wants to unpack it because they don't want to know that he's husband. They don't want to know that he is loving. They don't want to know. They don't know how to deal with him as romantic partner because they they have 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 have, have, have so objectified him that they can't imagine that there's more. And if they if he's this fine and there's so much more to him that they might figure out ain't no more to them. Mm. So when these two worlds come together, they're really walking through the, the impact of other people's shooting on you. And what do you do when you're through with love? But love's not through with you. With you. Are you open That's a good question. to the possibilities or are you jaded? So I'm on. looking forward to that 
I'm looking for, and I'm looking forward, uh, so I'm going to say this out loud too, I'm looking forward to um, a soundtrack that will include all black gay male artists. Mm. That's never happened before that I can think of. So, I'm, you know, this is Dylan Burnside, this is Billy Porter, this is B. Slay, this, 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 I want, I want the, I want the whole, you know, I want the soundtrack to lo to love like and feel like music. We can romance to and cry through and struggle through. And the beauty of it is, you know, the song, like it's always, it, it was always rooted in music. The song that ended up making its way into the book as the song that drew them together because it needed such weight and it had, it needed to have some history. The voice needed to be kind of in such a way that you couldn't distinguish even sometimes if it was male or female because there was weight to it. So the song ended up being Feeling Good by Nina Simone, you know, mm. because of the, the, the hollowness of the acapella, the weight of her voice, the bigness of the ending. Um, but um, I, I'm probably, and I'm saying it out loud just because I'm saying everything, I'm claiming this thing. You let the gods I'm is. probably going, I, there's the song that originally birthed the, that was originally in my ear was uh, from her first album. Miss Shantae Moore has a song called As If We Never Met that still reduces me to tears. And I want to hear somebody redo that who, 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 who loves like me. So that might be B. Slade. That might be, you know, Jonathan Celeste is definitely going to have the opening song. I've seen that in my eye. He's got a song called Superman that I know is going to open the mood. But somebody's redoing it as if we never met. Because that song started Jaden. It started it. So. How can people support you? Buy your books, follow so Esau, up. Esau said, don't forget my role. I hear you, Esam. Yeah, you go. Yeah, I'm, I, I, we go, we, I promise you, we, we're creating a whole new landscape for this. But Esau so, definitely Kevin, needs to be on. Kevin E. Taylor is how you find me, period. You know, it's it's my website, KevinETaylor.com. On here, y'all see it right there. I'm Kevin E. Taylor. Um, in most spaces, I'm Kevin E. Taylor. That's Facebook. I, I know that I. I think TM3, no, Kevin E. Taylor, TM3 is my Twitter, just because uh, an artist out of San Francisco had already copped Kevin E. Taylor as his Twitter. Mr. Kevin Earl Taylor, who was a white dude with a middle name <laughs> Earl. <laughs> but um, that's how you find, you know, buy the books. I generally tend to, you know, because I, I self-published and I'm proud of that, because I get to hold on to, I get to determine who my characters are, how they live, how they love, how they make love, how they, you know, um, how they how they be. Um, I get to, you know, it has allowed me the opportunity to find printers and graphic designers and editors and people who uh, who help me build the brand. And so, uh, you know, I you, most places it's like a two, you know, there's a two for twenty five or some kind of book like deal like that because I'm I'm just trying to get people to to grab hold to the stories, you know. Um, you know, Jaded uh, has a sequel called Envy, The Darkest Shade of Green. There's a separate book called Meet the Hendersons when uh, Joshua is in the bookstore where he meets Elijah while uh, he's talking to the old man who runs the bookstore uh, later on when they have when they have trouble and he's just wandering and he's weary. He finds himself back at the bookstore and Mr. Henderson, boy, let's sit down, let me tell you a story. Well, the story he tells is the beginning chapter of Meet the Hendersons. And Mr. Uh, Henderson's forty-six love affair, forty-six year love affair with his partner, and um, meeting them uh, on the day that one might be losing the other. And then there's a story called "Because He Lives," you know, a guy who's uh, who's not dealt with his sexuality, who's not dealt with his truth, because he's the only son in a family, and his father's got other dreams for him, and he's trying. He's ignored his his his, his, his art. He's ignored his joy and his journey because he, it just given the life he lives and the family he comes from, he doesn't get to do that. But then he meets this other guy. So his, he's Mark. He meets Jacob. And uh, they, it's Mark Jacob. Cook. Right. Mark. Well, it's actually both. All, so pastorally, they're all biblical names. Joshua, Elijah, Elijah Mark, Jacob, you know, uh, 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 the, main, the main characters are always biblical, you know, so... Um, the reason the Hendersons aren't is because they came out of another story, but Joshua and Elijah become sons of them. Um, and so they end up connecting and then getting pulled together, uh, pulled apart by a tragedy. And while Mark wants to move on acting like, you know, uh, uh, he can ignore what's happening in his heart, he can because he lives. Like he met an actual person, they had an actual love story, and you don't just get to throw that in the trash. And so it's the struggle of him trying to find his way back 
uh, of Jacob, of Mark trying to find his way back to Jacob and the family drama that ensues. And so, and, they, and then they, and that's that. And then, they, and then they're over here is, you know, unclutter, cleanse your spirit and claim your stuff. There is, uh, it's time for some action, 10 steps to living your truth. Uh, get off your ass and do something, uh, which uh, comes from, you know, a lot of people are like, how's a pastor write a book on get off your ass and do something? I was like, well, what happened on Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into town on a low, uh, 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 a slow moving, burden bearing, low riding thing so that people can say, oh, that's Jesus. Oh, he cool. He right there. He ain't up high on some horse. He ain't jogging the town. He's right here. And then he meets the people, greets the people who are going, he's real. And then he gets off that ass, that 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 burden and burden thing and takes back it and takes back his dad church. He's like, listen, these are supposed to be here's who's supposed to be in the church. Everybody, let's go. You know, <laughs> and so and then you know and then finally, um, my, my most recent book is my autobiography, Never Too Much. This is my story of big words, big dreams, and an audacious big life. Now y'all understand why I have him on my show. Talk about mastering the courage to pivot. Come on, because he did that. He did that. Father, I thank you. I love you, Jordan. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks for getting to have this conversation. It's so, you know, and Nick and, and Isam and, and, and Brother Roger, my friend from BET. I got to shout out my brother uh, O'Neill, Mass Adrenaline. King, King Spencer Means is just beautiful. Uh, see, and oh, God, see, and, uh, Nick just said, Elijah is the story of my life. And I know that, uh, you know, we know people, I know what it's like. I, I know people in my community that I can look at, yo, people are so busy looking at you. They don't know how to talk to you. You know, mm -hmm. people, you know, that's what life at BET was like that, a dating a rapper or two, an actor or two, an artist or two, because people were just kind of like, y'all went out here. Well, how Because I asked them? Oh, you talk mm -hmm. to people? I was like, y'all don't know how to talk to people? But that's no different than the way we're in the club. It's like now people see tall, beautiful Nick Q and go, that's your friend? Like, great. So so, so, what's his Instagram? It's like, but he right here. You want me to introduce you to him? No, 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 I'm good. But what's his name again? It's like <laughs> we're missing life because we're afraid to live it. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, people, if y'all want to, if y'all looking for a church, I'm going to say it out there. Well, well, because of COVID, he's pivoted into social media using social media. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so you know, I preached this morning, fail forward from John 3.16, the whole idea that failing is, the, is, is simply releasing an attempt because people treat failure like it was some sort of, you know, like it's some sort of bad thing. And, set, and failure is simply the, the neglect of doing something. Hello, somebody. It's the, even that's the that's neglect word. of doing something. Hello, somebody. Or it is like a missed attempt at something and we beat it we 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 write failures in ink when they're written in pencil right that's like it's you failed okay formula 409 means there were 408 attempts to make the formula hello how many times did the Wright brothers have something fall out of the sky that they were like okay well that don't fly let's do the next thing you know y'all don't know it your mama made you know your mama had to play with that you know that pound cake from scratch a few times but you're like mm -mm, i need a little what, what is that what is that missing I mean, you putting what you put lemon and a uh, uh, vanilla in that cake. That's why it's so good. And a little touch of rum. It's like she figured it out for herself by failing. And we're so we're so stuck in, you know, especially us in these creative arts uh, uh, opportunities. We're so afraid of failing that we don't give ourselves permission to make the attempts. Like my first, lyrically speaking, looked nothing like the last one, right? Because the first one was kind of, all right, here, you got a camera with Natalie Cole, okay. And it was Natalie herself who, we, in the interview, was like, we get ready, we're still talking, right? Let's, okay, let's move the camera over here for this part. And I was like, oh. So the next time, they let me bring two cameras. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, they were like, we know you needed two. I was like, I didn't either. I didn't know what it was going to be, and you know. And, we, and, and so we just have to give ourselves permission. And so every Sunday, you know, on Facebook Live, Unity Fellowship Church, New Ark, and that's literally just Newark, with the capital A, you know, we have service and on Wednesday nights we do Bible study. And so I think that's the ways that people see like how important and imperative faith is in this because people keep trying to make us feel like who we are is not worthy of faith and who we are is because of faith. It is because that we dare to be black, to be gay, to be tall, to be beautiful, to be bright. Some people mad you bright. You know, I, I know when we show up at Christmas parties with all of our black African on and gay ladies and sisters with sleeves and that, them earrings, they're like, mm, it don't take all that. It don't take all that for you because you don't know how to do all this. But this ain't, for us, it's Tuesday. Exactly. <laughs> 
Father. Daughter. I'm trying to be like you when I grow up. How you interview the legends, you are my legend that I'm interviewing. Oh, so I am much. honored. I am blessed. I'm honored. Yes, and this all stems from the conversation across the street at the park. Remembering uh, all of that, I'm like, nah, I got to interview him. When I was preparing my questions, I'm like, okay, yes, I did a lot of research, but a lot of that was just from that conversation. Like, okay, we got to highlight this. So I'm trying to be like you when I grow up. I love you. I love you too. I'll be the roadmap ahead. So I'm, look, I'm, I'm further on up the road. If you need me, holler. <laughs> I got you, boo. <laughs> Thank you, Father. I love you, daughter. All right, love. Oh, Do it again. Ah. Ah.